I'm Rebecca King Ferraro. And I'm Michael Sean Breeden. And you're listening to Conversations on Dance. On today's episode of Conversations on Dance, we are joined by former ballerina and incoming artistic director of American Ballet Theater, Susan Jaffe. Susan has previously appeared on the podcast in an interview that covered her rapid rise to stardom at ABT, the accompanying self-doubts during the success, and how working through those moments affects her present-day work as a coach and director. Today, she talks about her time directing Pittsburgh Ballet Theater through a pandemic, and what her plans are for when she takes the helm of American Ballet Theater later this year. Susan, thank you so much for joining us again today. We're so thrilled to have you back on. We had so much fun last time, so we're excited to delve back in with you today. Thank you. I I had a great time, so I'm excited too. (laughs) Um, If For anyone who missed that episode, we really hope that they go back because we had such a great chat with you about your career and dancing and so much like just great little nuggets in there. I was listening to it this morning. So I hope people go back and listen to that because we're just going to pick up today where we left off, Um, which at that point in um, 2020, you were just about to start at Pittsburgh Ballet Theater um, and as artistic director. And one of the things we chatted about with you was as a dancer, when you were receiving great accolades as a very young dancer within the company or getting new roles, very exciting things, you kind of felt like imposter syndrome instead of just saying like, oh, I'm great, I guess. You went the opposite (laughs) way and you really dove in and worked really hard. And so I wonder, as you entered a new role at Pittsburgh Ballet Theater, how did maybe that come into play as in this new place, in this new role, new sense of responsibilities? Uh, Well, I, you know, I like to inspire people to work hard. Um, Mm -hmm. I like to inspire them to delve deeper um, and I got so much more out of that um, by doing that and and felt so much more fulfilled. So I I like to share that joy with the other dancers. Um, So that's how that always comes into play whenever I'm coaching. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So what was that like, that transition into an artistic director role? Um, uh, It (laughs) was, it's, it's a, um, at Pittsburgh Valley theater, um, it's a smaller company. And so there's a lot more that the artistic director does as far as just administrative and coaching and all of those, all of those things Um, at American ballet theater, there's more infrastructure there. So I will have more support in areas that I was doing at, at PBT. Sure. Right. Um, But it was actually very similar. Um, in a lot of ways, to being a dean uh, at the University mm-hmm. of North Carolina School of the Arts, I learned a lot of administrative, a, a lot of administration there. I learned uh, how to work with uh, fourteen faculty and several staff members, and then two hundred and fifteen students. Right. Um, so it was similar um, in that I knew I understood that administrative load and what that meant and and why that was important. The difference was that um, I had a co-leader now Mm -hmm. um, at PBT. Mm -hmm. And so those um, decisions always had to be made together. And um, that was uh, just unusual. You know, I'm used to just kind of Mm -hmm. flying off on my own. Um, (laughs) And now you, you sit down and you collaborate and you talk. So that was, it's not that I didn't collaborate with my faculty. I did always ask them, uh, their opinions and, you know, how can we move forward? Um, but this was just a little bit different in that it was more, um, focused in that area. Sure. Right. Sure. What was it like, um, having to shepherd the company through the pandemic? I mean, starting at probably the most trying time in decades, you know, <laughs> holding a leadership position in an arts organization is difficult enough as it is, but, this was a really rough spot. So what, what was that like? And how do you feel like that, like, you know, that peak experience of, of getting a company through is going to guide you in the future at ABT? Yeah. yeah that was hard. <laughs> <laughs> that was hard. Um, I work very closely with our HR department and also a group of people at uh, administrators at PBT 
to figure out ways to get the dancers safely back into the building. You know, just like everybody else, we taped out square, uh, square 12, right. 12 square. Right. Uh, we had um, initially we had um, cohorts of five and we only had two studios or maybe two and a half studios. So, and the whole thing was literally about just getting in and taking class. basically. Right. Yeah. Um, and so some people were at home on zoom taking class. Some people were upstairs on zoom taking class. And then you, the instructor were in the studio teaching. Um, mm-hmm. and it was very hard, particularly on the dancers, you know, staying at home. So eventually they were the ones that came to me and said, can we increase our cohorts? Um, mm-hmm. and you know, Again, there were so many other things. There were wipes at every door. There were yeah. you know, bathroom protocols. There were all kinds of, you couldn't go to the locker room. There were just so many elements in place. In fact, we were more strict than AGMA. And in, in a way, that's how the dancers could trust me more quickly. Right. I said, well, whatever AGMA's doing, I'm actually going one step further. Mm-hmm. Um, and because I was so squeamish myself. Um, so, but we did that and then we increased our cohorts. Uh, we always kept masks. Um, and then I had to start thinking outside the box. Okay. Now what are we going to do with this time? And I, I also spent the, the, that time really zeroing in on each dancer Mm. And their technique and the way that they could work most efficiently, right. most beautifully and accurately. So it was great to have those small cohorts so I could really focus. Um, and, oh, my gosh, they worked so hard. <laughs> so literally rebuilding um, technique and getting better, whereas, you know, many people were still sitting at home. Many dancers were still sitting mm-hmm. at home. So. We, we use that time uh, well, um, but then also just how were we going to get back on stage? And right. our executive director, Harris Ferris, um, asked me if we thought if he thought it would be a great idea to get a mobile stage. Mm. And so I said, sure, let's get a mobile stage. And so we did. Um, and he fundraised for it. He's a wonderful fundraiser. Mm-hmm. And we started performances outside with donors uh, in our parking lot. <laughs> wow. And we taped out squares for them as well and little, right. little cohorts and um, lots of um, rules and regs about how to get to the stage with your mask. And if you, I also was so lucky because so many dancers were couples. Mm-hmm. Oh. So I did a whole evening of pas de deux with couples. That's and, so fun. Uh, it was amazing. Um, and then we did have a, a one or two sets of dancers saying we, we don't mind dancing with each other because we, we spent a lot of time together. Right. So I, I was I managed to make a whole evening, in fact, two whole evenings, and we did that. And then um I created a, a short seven minute piece called Dracula's Kiss for Halloween weekend, and we did that at the mm-hmm. Carnegie Museum. Nice. And um, that was a cast of five, but they were all the, the Dracula and Lucy were, of course, a couple. But um, mm-hmm. and that worked really well because the audience was on the balcony because you could only have like 25 people per floor. Mm-hmm. So in order to get 25 people to watch the seven minute show, they were up on the balcony and we were on the down, down on the floor. This gorgeous um, uh, spot called. Uh, the uh, hall of sculpture and it was all white marble. It was gorgeous. So we did that. And then um, we also did a filmed version of the nutcracker and a shorter film ver- uh, version called a fireside nutcracker. And we did that also by um, having small cohort, cohorts of like four women, for example, let's just right. talk about the walls of the flowers. And we put a camera overhead and we mapped out where they could be. And so once one four did that section and then they left and another four did that section and then they left. And so we put it all together in the splicing and it looked like it was a full stage. That's, That's amazing. Wild. That's so cool. 
So I mean, we did uh, film frontal and overhead. And, and so, um, so that was really fun. And we also got to, to film in Hartwood Acres, which is this beautiful old home. So the living room scene really was from that century. And it was, wow. it won four awards. Uh, so we were really proud. And our filmmaker, Christian Lockerman, did a great job. Cool. Um, we had another digital program later uh, in February with just Parada. And then I did, um, for um, Valentine's Day, I did a, uh, a piece to Bolero. And they were all in like little shirts and little pencil pants and the women were in red and the men were in black. And I choreographed the entire thing in separate studios. And only when the day of the the performance, we got the the company together because we were also in the hall of sculpture. So it was huge. So we could dance. They all had masks. Um, Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, that was the first time I got to see it come all together and it works. So mm-hmm. there were just things that we did. And I know that there are a lot of companies that did a lot of amazing things, um, mm-hmm. but that's what we did. Just trying to think outside the box in a, on a small company with our budget, what we could do. Um, so it really made me understand, well, we don't have to always be on a proscenium stage. You know, we right. can do other things. Yeah, I think the whole dance world figured that out, you know, and, we didn't think we could do it, but we did it. And um, so anyway, it was, it was wild. And it, it, of course it was very, very long days of figuring everything out, but um, it was worth it. It was really fun. Uh, at what point were you then able to get back into a theater? Let's see. Um, we did do a spring show on the mobile stage as well. We came back mm-hmm. into the theater on um in October of 2021. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of when everyone was starting a little bit to inch back in. Right. Yeah. 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 I wonder, um, as I'm hearing you talk, I'm thinking Michael and I were at Miami city Ballet when we had the transition from Edward Vlela to Lourdes Lopez as artistic director. We know that you of course were at EBT during artistic director transitions. So I'm, kind of wondering, like from the dancer perspective, not only was that time so scary, you weren't on stage, you weren't in your best shape, but then to have a new director coming in on top of that and like how scary that can already be to kind of prove yourself in that way. So how, how did you work to kind of put yourself in the dancer's shoes? And then like you mentioned, find ways to earn their trust through this very unique time. Well, you know, I mean, the first thing I am is a coach. um, And my job as a coach is to be the biggest cheerleader, you know, like really give the information and be the biggest cheerleader and show dancers that they can go further than even they thought, you know, where they, even their mind, their limitation was, you know, try to get them to, to see a larger picture of themselves. So I, I did that. Um, we, we did talk a lot as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it's very hard and it's um, as an artistic director because there's always that hierarchy. It's always there, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, um, there's always that, okay, sh- she or he are the boss, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I have to figure out how to impress them. And um, so when I would have my one-on-ones with the dancers, I would, you know, ask them things like, well, what can we do to make your experience better, you know? what can I do as your artistic director to be better for you? You know, what can the organization do Um, to try to just give the dancers the opportunity to give us feedback. I got some fabulous feedback from the dancers um, about what we could do. Um, So in as much as I could do to, to try to um, keep everybody calm and and feeling good. um, I I did my absolute best to do that. Yeah. So when the position became available at ABT, was this something that you immediately uh, wanted to throw your hat into the ring for? Or did you have to kind of be coaxed in it, into it where people were like, Susan, this is a good fit for you? You know, what, what was that application process like? Well, actually, I had applied and got gotten the directorship of PBT before um, or had accepted that role at PBT just before Kevin announced his, um, retirement. So I thought, wow, that was, 
interesting timing. Um, <laughs> and it, it kind of never occurred to me to leave uh, PBT because uh, I had, you know, whenever I, I go somewhere, I just put my whole heart and soul into it. Right. Um, and so, and I was thinking, oh, it's nice to have a smaller company. You have more flexibility. You can do maybe even be more risky um, at, in a smaller company than you would maybe in a larger company. So I wasn't thinking about it. Um, and then the search firm reached out to me. Mm. And, you know, it's always good to um, talk to search firms because you learn so much, you know, about what else that that company's doing and things like that what kind of leader they're looking for, or what they, what they are, uh, think are their priorities, et cetera. So I uh, just as an um, exercise, I, um, I said I would apply and I did. And um, it wasn't because I thought I was leaving PBT. I never thought I would. I would, I never thought I would become the director of American Ballet Theater. It just, I just didn't think that that would happen, but I just, mm. I just thought it would be a wonderful thing to just hear all about it. And, and so, um, and so as I was talking to the search firm and talking to the committee, um, I really thought, oh my gosh, this is really home, you know, mm. um, yeah. And um, I knew so much about what the committee was talking about and had had thoughts over the years about, well, what would I do, you know, uh, to to make this a smoother whatever. Mm -hmm. And so um, we just had these wonderful discussions, you know, and it was just really like being home. And so um, and so the more I talked with the committee, the more. I tried not to get too excited, to be yeah. honest. Um, but the, the more excited I became, and um, and also I think they were so um, not used to speaking to an artist that also had so much um, focus on the organization holistically, right? Um, and so I think that was different for them. Um, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, um, you know, actually, uh, after my last interview, I had gone to New York and I spent the whole day. I thought it went really well. Um, we had an evening dinner and, after, and when I walked out of that dinner, I thought maybe that didn't go so well. Um, <laughs> and so I went home and, you know, I was like, I, I love PBT and all of that. So anyway, um, the day that the search firm called me, half an hour before, uh, some friend of mine sent me an article about um, how ABT had to be run by either Misty Copeland or by uh, Stella Abrera. And uh, my response back was like, ABT needs to do what's best for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is what they need to do. Right. And so at 9.04 in the morning, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, I get a call from the search firm. And the person said, hi, this is so-and-so. Just very, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, uh, well, I just want you to know. And I'm totally ready for him to say the committee has decided to go in another direction. <laughs> And he said, the committee has decided that you are the one. <laughs> and oh my I, I just, I was so shocked. I was, I was so shocked um, and, and overwhelmed and, um, and, and so honored. Uh, so anyway, when it was offered to me, I thought, no, I, I've got to go home. I've got to go home. Mm -hmm. I, I know that company. I know all the ins and outs of that kind of repertory and what mm -hmm. that level is. And um, I, I've got to go home. And I, I'm just one of those people that, I, you know, I like to walk into organizations and, and, and 
make them beautiful and not that they, it's, it's wonderful now, but, you know, to put, to put it in a, in a, as best direction as, as possible. And so um, here I am, I'm, I'm mm. coming to ABT. And I just want to say one thing is that Kevin McKenzie, current artistic director, he has been incredibly generous with me. Uh, we meet once a week and um, he has been forthright and honest. And, okay. Here's what's going well. Here are the, here are the, you know, uh, stressors. Mm-hmm. He's been amazing. And um, so that's been really uh, a joyful experience. And yeah. I, I'm so happy to hear that. That's so great. It's it's pretty unusual, or you know, it's it's not that common that that these sort of peaceful transitions of power happen between companies. You know, oftentimes there's a lot of upheaval, or you know, the outgoing director isn't necessarily leaving on their terms or didn't um, have any association with the incoming director. So, how do you think that this positive relationship you have with Kevin is going to impact, especially I, I imagine your early years as director? Well, there's just this um, this this level of comfort. You know, I've known Kevin since, my gosh, 1985, <laughs> you know, um, and so the level of comfort, the level of trust, the level of honesty, I know that, that Kevin is absolutely giving me everything he can because he loves the company. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's really nice. It's just very, I feel so there's so much trust there. Um, and now I'm starting to also go into other meetings with some staff, uh, not necessarily the rehearsal directors, but other staff. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, I trust them so much. It's, and if walking into a new place, you don't know who to trust. You don't know mm-hmm. if this person is always telling the truth or if this person is emotional or if this person is, you know, I mean, every organization has a different thing. And I, I have known all of these people for so many years as a Mm -hmm. dancer and then as a rehearsal coach Mm -hmm. and now as the artistic director. So how will that lead me into the future is that right now, I think I'm just taking in all the information. There are things I definitely want to do. And, you know, I do know that these big companies take a long time to turn, right? you know, uh, to steer it in a, and it's not that it's going to go in a hugely different direction, mm-hmm. but um, you know, there are things I want to do fundraising things as well, uh, getting some, so, so that we can do the kind of repertory um, that, you know, for example, every year right now, you can only do one new thing in the fall and one new thing in the spring. So then mm-hmm. you're, you're not able to really create a full program that you want to create. You you're, you know, you're sort of stuck, uh, stuck. How can you be stuck in this? But anyway, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. More restrictive. So, yeah. I was speaking with um, another artistic director who had raised a hundred million dollars just for production. Wow. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want <laughs> to make sure that a, the dancers have enough time to rehearse because I, mm-hmm. that's also very tight. Mm-hmm. You know, we're on a 36 week contract. It would be really nice to have more uh, right. weeks and then the opportunity to have more weeks so that we can also do more new things. Um, not necessarily like new creations all the time, but new to the company. Right. Um, right. And so that's, that is one of the things I really want to focus on is, is how can we make this the, the, the most the best grounds for the greatest art with great artists. You know? Yeah. yeah. When, when you were mentioning earlier um, that Kevin was saying, you know, these are the things that are working. These are things that we want to improve upon. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Like, what, what do you think right now at ABT are its strengths that you're looking to bolster? bolster and what are things that you see some room for improvement in? Uh, I definitely think that the first thing is, you know, getting enough funding for new works. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Also, um, I would really like to uh, look further out as far as touring um, so that 
one of the things that's very difficult on the dancers is that they'll have a chunk of time, then they'll have a chunk of time off, and then they'll come back mm-hmm. and have another chunk of time. And so they get injured, of course. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, and I would like to uh, keep that, be able to, to book the touring earlier so that we can keep the dancers dancing as much as possible for as long as possible. Cause that's how dancers get better. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, that's how they um, uh, maintain their, their health. Uh, so I'd like to, I'd like to do that. That's something uh, really important. Um, and then, you know, I mean, as I said, the, the repertory, um, well, it's, it really depends upon the venues, you know, like mm, sure. we're at the Metropolitan Opera House a lot. And so that's where all the big major full lengths are. So, um, and there are some full lengths that need some updating. <laughs> uh, and so, and we're really known for, we're known for our full length ballets, our classical ballets, our stories. Um and so I would like to update some things that need updating and I would like to create new works, uh, new stories um, and bring, you know, diverse voices in those stories as well. Um, so those are just a few things that are uh, oh, just little things anyway <laughs> um, that I would like to do. Yeah, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. I kind of for me, I kind of think of ABT's rep in three sections. You obviously have the full lengths that are so integral to the Met season, but you have other legacy works like the DeMille, um, Tudor, Twyla things that, um, you know, create these triple bill evenings. Yeah. Uh, and then of course you have the next phase of new work. So, um, can we talk a little bit about each of those? It, go, going back to, let's start with the full length. You said there's some that you need updating. I'm assuming you're referring to Corsair and Bider, which you've already, already mentioned as problematic. And um, are there specifics yet that you've kind of honed in on on what, what you might like to do there? Yes. Uh, I, I uh, spoke with this wonderful designer that designs a lot for Christopher Wilden. His name is Jean-Marc Puisson. Mm-hmm. And he, he designed Of Love and Rage, Alexei Ratmaz's mm-hmm. last full-length ballet for ABT. And it was just wonderful. Mm-hmm. And um, I met him. We were all backstage. And I said, let's go to dinner. <laughs> and so uh, I started talking about things that are problematic, for example, in La Baya there. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, there are so many things that could have been problematic in Of Love and Rage. Mm -hmm. But what I did as a designer was that I worked with curators, scholars, and everything that I did on that stage is an absolute replica of real stuff in the museums, the actual dress, the actual things. I didn't change one thing. Hmm. And um, so I said, let's, let's start to work on, on La Bayadere. Cause mm-hmm. I, I really do feel that to throw this work out is, it's just a bad idea. Mm-hmm. Um, so he went off, you know, asked Jean-Marc to do something and whoo, he runs mm-hmm. off with it. Um, and we had a wonderful meeting uh, a couple of months ago. And he said, well, he said, I spoke with two Indian scholars uh, about La Bayadere. And there were, and here, he said, it's not that many things that are actually problematic about it, which I was, I was kind of gleefully surprised. Um, he said, but there are some things. For example, this bow with the head and the heart, he said, that's Turkish. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. You know, yeah. so there are things that you can do. Um, also, he said fakirs, which are in uh, Natalia Makarova's La Bayadere. A fakir is actually a person of high rank in the church or a church, mm-hmm. in the, the religious um, group. And here and they're depicted as men crawling around on the ground, making the fire. Right. So. Mm-hmm oh my goodness, those are not fakirs at all. You know, so there are things that are just 
were just misunderstandings uh, from the original um, mm-hmm. that can be absolutely uh, reworked and mm-hmm. working directly with Indian scholars to make sure that everything that we do is is not misappropriation. Um, right. So that's something that to me is a, is very exciting because, mm-hmm. um, you know, how many full lengths are there? They're not that many, you know, they're not that many classical ballets. And I, I am determined to save the tutu. I, I think tutu ballets uh, and the classical works for the men and for the women are, are amazing. And I don't right. think that they should all be thrown out. Um, right. So I'm excited about Bayadere. I, I want to, um, do that pretty soon and in the next couple of years. So that will be mm-hmm. one project. Going on to the, um, it's my, funny you should mention Twyla Tharp. Next year, in 24, 25, 25 actually, uh, is her 50th anniversary. A diamond, it's, it's a big anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I said, Twyla, we're going to celebrate you. Absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. And so we will do a triple bill about um, oh. of Twyla's work and also film and discussion and everything around the Twyla Tharp. I'm super excited to do that. Uh, she's one of the great choreographers um, of last century, this century. Uh, so we'll, we'll be doing that. And then I have, you know, new works that I am uh, interested in. Um, well, we have a choreographer who's a very famous choreographer in Europe, David Dawson, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I will be bringing his work in in the 23-24 season. So I'm excited about that. Uh, and then more women, a new piece by Kathy Marston, um, mm. both summer mm-hmm. book. And as I'm going out into the future, I've been talking uh, with more people. Um, I, I will be talking with Alonzo King soon um, about a new work he was thinking about. So, um, and then, you know, I would in the future like to do something more with our choreographic incubator, something a little bit uh, more fleshed out, um, whether that's a a festival in the summer, something, something a little bit more fleshed out there. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. So, so that's really, and then new full length story ballet. Mm. that aren't necessarily tutus um and uh because for example of love and rage was amazing and we're going to be doing chris wilden's like water for chocolate that was a co-production between ballet theater and the royal ballet right so i'm really looking forward to seeing that i actually was Mm -hmm. supposed to go to london and my plane got so delayed that actually by the time I would arrive in London, um, oh. we'd be halfway through the show. So oh, no. oh. it's crazy. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I really am excited about new story ballets, uh, especially of today's, you know, with today's sensibilities. Yeah. What are the mechanics of the programming um, during these transitions? Because of course, while Kevin was, we knew ever that he was stepping down and retiring, they, there's still a budget. You still have to do programming. So he probably programmed out a little in the future. When does your programming kick in? And did you guys have any back and forths about that? How did that work? He did the 22, 23 season. Okay. Um, and the one ballet that is um, from him in or for under his uh, direction is the summer in smoke from Kathy Morstan. Mm-hmm. So, and happily I <laughs> you know, put that on our, our program. So everything in the 23, 24 season will be mine. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because I, 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 I realized quickly that you can't just program everything you want. You just can't. Um, right. uh, I put together a Met season and spoke with pr- production and I said, we can't do it. Oh, mm-hmm. oh, well, why can't we do that? Well, because this, this is so big and then we can't do that and bring in that and so big. And we, we only have a half a day and, and, you know, can you put in something that's easier on production so that, mm-hmm. you know, you can't just, you have to actually, um, work a lot with production, um, and it may not necessarily always be everything you want to put on. Um, right. 
for example, in one season, you know, I try to think cohesively, you know, like, is there like, what's the arc right. you know, of the year? And even what's the arc of the next season? Um, and it, it's not as easy as, oh, this is what I want. It's just not that right. easy. Sure, sure. There's so much involved in it. Um, so going back to our conversation that we had with you last time, um, when we were closing out, one of the things that you said that was going to be really important for you as an artistic director was communication with your dancers. And another conversation that we had with you was you talked about having someone give you a fat talk when you were a young dancer at American Ballet Theater telling you you had to lose 10 pounds, which was irrational, I'm sure. <laughs> and so as dancers, we know how damaging those kind of conversations can be. And so I just wonder if there's things that you look back on um, your time as a dancer that you want to change moving forward in the way that you're communicating with your dancers. Yes. Um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I recognize uh, now as artistic director uh, of PBT for two years that, you know, even if you think you're communicating like, look, I can't fix it if you don't tell me. Mm -hmm. And even if you communicate that, mm -hmm. that still isn't necessarily enough for a dancer to feel comfortable to come and talk to you. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's kind of, wow. Um, when I was a, at UNCSA, I said to the students, come and talk to me if you have a problem. And it mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. Um as you get into the professional world, it's not necessarily the case. Um, and I think it's because you're their boss, you're their supervisor, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I actually was talking with Ted Branson, um, director of Pet National, mm -hmm. and I said, what do you do? And mm -hmm. he said, um, he said about four times a year, and I, I wanna do this, he said about four times a year, we just have these chats. We just sit down and we just talk about anything. Um, we, and also we can also talk about um, things that, that they have an issue with. So, um, uh, and I, and I thought that would just like, just these sort of powwows where we just sit around and talk about, okay, how can we improve this? Um, and, you know, for example, um, now that there's just much more um, uh, focus on gender, you know, mm -hmm. help me problem solve with you uh, when we're in a major big rehearsal. Like, how do you want me to address you? Right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, so there, there are all of these things that are that are new, uh, and also I think giving dancers uh, the opportunity and responsibility to create a culture uh, that they also want to, to, to thrive in where their input um, is, is brought into the fold as well. Now I did that privately with every single dancer in my, in my discussions with them, but I think in a larger group, uh, perhaps it just, it might have more impact or there might be more um, safety or something like that. So I just think that's a really good idea. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm going to do that. Um, and even Ted said, you know, uh, we had uh, these wonderful um, seminars on during the pandemic on uh, really sports. Uh, what do you call that? Um, it's not sports medicine. Psychology. There we go. Thank sports you. Psychology. Sports psychology. And he said they want more of that. You know, yes, sad, yes. Sad. Want more of that. And he said, well, he did say to the dancers, you know, because there's only so much time, as you know, there's only so much time to get something off. Um, so he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the dancers and say, OK, I can't give you rehearsal time. We, you know, we can't do this on rehearsal time. Can you help me brainstorm about what we can do? How can we offer this? Um, uh, in a way that, that, that can work for the schedule, you know, because right. he said, you want me to bring all these new works, but I can't bring all these new works if we're sure. doing seminars and taking up. So anyway, yeah. it's, it's, I think nowadays there's more of a dialogue, um, which is really helpful. Uh, right. Very helpful. So I think those things, um, 
those big group talks, I think, well, I will, I will do more or I will do those at my right. family. Mm -hmm. Sure. So eventually shortly into your um, new role as director, you'll be hiring new dancers. So what are some of the qualities that you most admire in dancers and will be looking for in your new hires? Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> and there's so many elements to a dancer, you know, uh, and at ballet theater, you know, it's going to be really hard to look at an audition and see if a dancer is an artist, you know, that's, that's really hard uh, to understand. You can see if they're musical, you can see if they're presence, you know, you can see if they uh, have a beautiful movement quality or have strength and coordination and all those things. Um, so of course I will look at all of those things uh, for, to, to, to hire somebody. Um, and then, you know, I think so much of what I learned about being an artist was on the job. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so I also look for openness, you know, the ability to learn quickly, the ability to be open. And you can tell that really easily, mm -hmm. very easily um, by how, when, you know, I can see in a dancer's eyes if they love it, mm -hmm. you know, if they're, I'm standing in front of somebody and I give them a, a correction, I can see if they love it, you know? Mm -hmm. and so if you love something, you're going to work so hard and you're going to keep exploring and bring more dimensions and all of those things, because that's how the art form moves forward. So I'm going right. to be looking for that too. Um, mm -hmm. so it's not just about tondus and jumps and pirouettes, you know, it's really uh, bringing a person who's just loves it with all their heart. Yeah. And has, you know, their the talent behind that. So. Yeah. You talked about um really loving to coach. And so I wonder what you're most looking forward to getting in the studio and sinking your teeth into um and working with the dancers of ABT. Well, I did get to coach a little bit uh on this past Met season. Oh, and fun. you know, the dancers there are so hungry. Um and it was almost, um, what's the word? Just a little bit of resting. I would, I would give a correction and they would come so like over me, like just wanted to, they just wanted to hear everything, you know? Yeah. And they were like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And oh, it was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. I just, they're so on fire. They're on fire. Mm -hmm. And and so everything um, will be an exploration. Everything will be, um, and, and I love to pass on what I learned. Um, and, I, and I give a lot of input uh, because that's how I was coached. Um, right. And so, and, and I think dancers love that, you know, most dancers really love that. Um, I did remember when I was dancing, Kolpakova, uh, Irina Kolpakova, I had to tell her, I said, you know, Irina, you can only give me one correction per step <laughs> because I can't take 15 corrections for a glee saw. Like I can't yeah. <laughs> take it all in, you know? <laughs> right. So I had to sort of teach her how to teach me. Um, so anyway, I, I look forward to all of that. And also, you know, the dramatic works, you know, I spent so much time with a dramaturg, uh, in, in how do you really develop the character? And so I want to pull that out and help people discover, you know, their truth uh, within their, their own being uh, in, in what they bring to these characters and what those characters can also bring to them. So uh, I'm excited to do that. Right. The role of guest stars has kind of fluctuated through the company's history. Sometimes, um, you know, Met season will look like it's dominated by guests from around the world. And then more recently, um, Kevin has adopted a policy of promoting heavily through the ranks. So most of the people that we see um, taking on those full lengths are people that have come up through studio company or at least through the core and through the ranks. So what role do you see guest artists playing in uh, your future as the director? Yeah, I do think 
uh, a guest artist or two guest artists every once in a while is a wonderful thing for everybody. Um, but I also, not but, and I also think it's very important to bring up our own artists. Mm-hmm. I was brought up that way. You know, Barishnikov, uh took a group of us and said, you know, all of these uh, stars were imported from Europe and I'm going to nurture American stars. And so there was a group of us that he nurtured. And so I am a very firm believer in that. Um, and so in order for dancers to get better, they have to have opportunity. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, we can't have an amazing, you know, couple come and do one or two shows of something every once in a while. It's not going to sure. be a year. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So just to wrap up, um, let's pretend that the sky's the limit. You have no budget. You don't have to worry about production and (laughs) how everything comes together. Is there one like dream, maybe production, a ballet project that you would love to bring to APT? My goodness. What (laughs) a question. Uh, That was a fun one. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Um, I definitely would want to. Now, I don't know the story, but I definitely want to create a have somebody create a new story ballet or, mm-hmm. for, for ballet theater. That's, I think, you know, watching of Love and Rage, a new creation. And oh my gosh, the men, the technique of the men in, in, in of Love and Rage, we call it Olar. Mm hmm. Saying of love and rage is a very long title. Oh, I like it. <laughs> I love that. Um, seeing the men dancing in Olar, I've never seen corps de ballet men dancing with such difficult steps. And, yeah. and you know, it's really a choreographer's ballet. Like, if you really understand choreography, you're going to look at that stuff and you're going to think, how the heck are they doing this? You know? Right. Yeah. And, and I w- I'm so impressed and so blown away. Of course, the story is a 400. 400- BC story. Um, so uh, I definitely want to create a new full length ballet and we do get to have new full length works every year, not always necessarily a new creation. So right. be looking for 2025, um, a new full length. And um, I was talking with a female choreographer and I wanted her to do it, but she now wants to do an hour long ballet. Mm. Uh, instead of a full length of so, oh, darn, uh, you know, uh, but uh, so now I'll, I will focus. And in fact, I just had that conversation yesterday. So mm. I was thinking I was going to be doing that with her, but now I have to uh, pivot and think of something else. So, oh, so much work. What was the production time? Like putting everything together for, um, for Olar. <laughs> it's a lot of time, right? Yeah. It's definitely a uh, minimum a year and a half. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, minimum. But but yeah. usually more. I think Olar uh, from conception to uh, it being coming a, a full length ballet was something like four years. Yeah, wow, yeah. So. a lot. Yeah. yeah, that's wild. Well, Susan, we're so happy that you're home, and thank you for spending this time with us. We can't wait to see the company under your direction. Yeah. Thank you so much, and thank you for this wonderful discussion. It's just it's just great to talk with other mm-hmm. artists. So. Thanks. We had a great. Always time. a pleasure with you. Thanks. Thank you. 